Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the XP Factory PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it is appropriate to do so. Um, before we begin, we would just like to submit the following poll. And if you'd give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I would now like to hand you over to the executive management team from XP Factory. Richard, Graham, good morning. Morning, Jay. Good morning, everybody on the call. Um, morning. So just by way of introduction for anybody that doesn't know us, um, I'm Richard, I'm the Chief Executive at X, uh, XP Factory. Graham here is the Chief Financial Officer. And what we're looking to do is take you through the highlights from our um, last financial year. And it's probably worth um, just making the point, I'm sure most of you will be aware, but actually um, this is a 15 month period that we're reporting on this time. We've changed our accounting year end to the 31st of March to align better with other leisure and hospitality businesses. So for this one uh, particular um, uh, presentation this morning, we are actually talking to 15 months numbers, just so that everybody is aware. But I thought just before we get into the slides, um, again, just in case there's anybody new to the business, it might be worth giving a very brief overview of exactly what it is that we do. So at XP Factory, we've got two trading brands. We've got Escape Punts and we've got Boom Battle Bars. Escape Hunt is now the leading global provider of escape the room experiences. And an escape room is ostensibly a really exciting, fun, immersive experience where you bring your team together, typically four to six people. We um, put you together in a heavily themed, almost theater set uh, type environment, and you work together to find clues, solve puzzles and escape the room. Boom Battle Bars is um, a newer business for us. Um, it's been trading now um, just over a couple of years um, under our ownership. And it is very much in that competitive socializing space. So we have large format spaces, um, large bars anchored with real variety of games. It might be answering, it might be golf, it might be uh, augmented reality darts. Um, really fun, high energy environment. And, and as I say, across them, both businesses, we're, we're here today to talk a little bit about the results. So diving into that, um, just excuse me, moving the slides through. Um, I suppose the high level overview of the performance to, 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 to March is that um, this really was the manifestation of all the hard work we put in into the site growth through the previous financial year. So um, a, a number of you will be very aware that we went upon, we embarked upon a really aggressive build program um, through 22 particularly, where we opened a very significant number of sites, um, circa 25 sites on the boom side and a few on the escape hunt side as well, really to kind of push through, make the best use of capital and, um, and set the foundations for hopefully what was to become a, uh, a, a very much more profitable business and a much bigger business. So what you're seeing here a year on is really the result of that work. You're seeing quite substantial increases um, in, in all the major p and lines. So seeing as you are there, um, 57 million pounds of revenue delivered um, for the group. Now, appreciate the counterfactual is a 12 month period, but nonetheless, it gives you a bit of a flavor for scale. That 57 is up from um, uh, you know almost 23 in the prior period. And similarly, EBITDA pre-IFRS 16 is up to six, um, 6.3 million pounds, a little bit ahead of the market expectation, um, up from the 2.6 in the previous period. So that substantial growth, as I say, is, is, is born in quite a large part from that big expansion program that we, um, that, that, that we built in 2022. Operationally, um, the last year was very much about bringing those sites that we built to life. So it was about honing the operation. It was about getting the best out of our teams, particularly on the boom side, which is the newer business. It was looking for opportunities to find efficiencies and, um, a, a, and operating gains. And we'll talk through some of that detail as we get into it. But, but I suppose the highlights um, at a very high level, obviously, is the, is the growth in revenue and the growth in um, adjusted EBITDA. Um, it's really important, I think, to point out that where that revenue has, um, has increased uh, significantly, it's born of some really strong like for like. So you'll see there that Escape Hunt delivered almost 17% like for like sales growth and boom 22. And what's really exciting for me in those numbers is that they represent entirely 
volume driven like for like growth. There is no price in this number. We have not taken price as a business. Um, in, in the context of uh, you know the, the kind of the headlines that we read every day, the cons- you know the challenging consumer headwinds, etc. We felt it was appropriate to absorb the you know the, the electricity price increases. We felt it was appropriate to absorb the wage increases um, that you've seen through national living wage, etc. And instead, look to cover those by driving volume-led like-for-like growth, which of course leverages back through the PL. So I think it's a really strong indication of where both those businesses have been performing from an underlying perspective. And we'll get into a little bit more of the detail now. So if I move through to uh, talk a little bit about some of the escape hunt specific dynamics. So you'll see escape hunt delivered almost 17 million pounds of owner operated sales. And again, the 12 month period that that compares to was just under 10. So again, you know, that transformative level of growth there, born in a very large part from these like for likes. But what's been great to see in Escape Hunt is that this very high margin um, business has continued to trade as such. So this 42 level, uh, 42% EBITDA um, at a site level um, has held pretty constant to the prior period. And, and I think is, is quite a remarkable place to be, certainly far outside the expectations which we as a management team set for ourselves when we embarked upon our journey with Escape Hunt. You know, at the time, good would have looked like achieving 30% um, on, on sales of about half a million pounds per year per unit, whereas now we're seeing sort of 42% on sales around 650,000 on average. So, so that business has really continued to grow, continued to perform. And alongside that trading performance, obviously we're seeing this increase in the return on capital as well. 48% return on capital for that business, really born of the fact that the underlying economics are improving within Escape Hunt and have improved quite significantly, but the capital base has really remained stable. We'll talk about that in a little more detail further into the deck, but we haven't had to make anything of the reinvestments that we may have imagined we could have done. So that return on capital has been very, very high. As a business, we've always prided ourselves on the reviews that we have received from customers. Um, we, we've maintained that 99% average review score, five-star review score, um, uh, across the year as well. So it's so a really strong um, sense of customer satisfaction within, within Escape Hunt. And in terms of the sites themselves, um, as I say, really the year was about the consolidation of the build that we've done previously. It was about driving the efficiencies that we had through the, um, through the estate to be able to demonstrably show the underlying cash generation that, that we now had um, at our access. But that said, we did nonetheless open another Escape Hunt in Woking, and so you'll, you'll uh, com- continue to see that site um, grow. And, uh, and, and we have some current sites in build um, in, in, into this current financial year. So sites in, um, in Worcester, Cambridge and Glasgow. So those sites are there. Um, but a really strong performance for Escape Hunt, as I say, quite dramatically outside the expectations which we'd originally set for ourselves on that business. So um, it's been a really nice year to be able to report upon. If we move into a little more detail around Boom, Again, with so much of the build program in 2022 being around building that very, very nascent business, um, at the time that five site business into a business that's now got the 30 sites that are trading today, um, unsurprisingly with that has followed the quite significant step up in revenues from nine and a half million pounds to 37 and a half over the 15 month period. But again, within there, um, you're, you're seeing this really strong level of life like growth, 22% life like growth on the sites that have been trading for more than 12 months. And again, I reiterate the point that that is entirely volume led growth. So, um, so, so it feels like a really good place to be trending. And um, within, uh, within the year just gone, we did open um, a, a small number of boom sites additionally. So we opened in Canterbury, Dubai, and in South Bend. <laughs> But we've also brought back um, into our owned and operated um, estate a number of additional franchisee sites. Um, and we, we've stated previously that where there is opportunity to do that and where the economics look really attractive for us as a business, we are quite keen to do it. We still believe philosophically that franchising is an interesting place for us to go, maybe at some point in the future, but we think there might be a way to do it at a slightly greater scale. And part of that, if you like, tidying up process um, requires us to bring back a few of uh, a few of the sites into our flock first, and we'll talk a little bit about how those sites have gone on to um, uh, perform for us post acquisition a little further into the deck. 
In terms of um, the overall EBITDA generated by Boom, um, we are obviously still very much a growing business for Boom, and 17% um, EBITDA across the group was delivered, 4% um, up from the prior period. And it's, um, it's worth reminding people that we've set for ourselves a target of getting to um, 20, 22, 25% EBITDA over time for the group as a whole, for Boom. And so seeing 17% at this stage feels very much um, like the right kind of numbers. We're on the right trajectory. You've got to remember that when we um, have young sites maturing, and indeed open new sites, they will lose money before they make money. And so you have this dilutive effect um, born of maturity. So when that blends out to a number of 17%, despite the uh, relatively immature estate and some new sites coming on board in the year, we feel pretty confident that that um, target that we've set for ourselves is very much achievable and, and, and indeed that we're on track for it. Customer reviews have again been very, very high in this business, materially higher than the industry per se. Um, again, testaments to the operating teams that we have um, in the business. So overarchingly, it's been a really strong um, performance, I think, for both brands. Great to see the overall economics for XP are really starting to come through. Great to see proper cash flow being generated, which Graham will talk to in a moment. Um, and I think a really exciting foundation from which to grow. Um, we thought it would be uh, interesting just to remind you um, a little bit about the metrics which we see as being the most important as we consider performance in the business. And, and for us, this return on capital metric is the thing that normalizes the, you know, kind of the big sites and the small sites. It normalizes for us between escape hunt and boom. And it is the thing that allows us to consider where we best deploy our capital um, as, as we go forwards. So here, here we have um, a, uh, a, a chart showing the return on capital for the escape pump business. And I mentioned a moment ago that we've averaged out to 48% um, return on capital, which I, I think you might agree is very, very high. And what's exciting here is that as performance grows, we just haven't seen a need yet to reinvest particularly in these sites. So obviously maintenance uh, capital, et cetera, um, in, in the main is kind of running through the P&Ls of the site, i.e. it's captured in EBITDA. And there's a little bit of maintenance that sits outside it, which Graham will talk to, that comes <laughs> below the line. But the big point here is that even our oldest sites, our seven-year trading sites, are still trading the same games as we originally built and are still showing this really demonstrably high levels of volume driven life like growth. So accordingly, the return on capital has been really strong and continues actually to improve, at, at least as we sit here today. If we move through to Boom, um, you're seeing you know, another sort of similar story. Now, Boom has actually, on average, a slightly higher return um, on capital than Escape Hunt, albeit marginally, circa 52%. But what you haven't yet got in the bulk of the boom state is the benefit of that maturing economic profile. So if we're right and if um, the uh, businesses continue to grow and therefore EBITDA continues to grow, and if indeed the uh, sort of the requirement for additional capital um, kind of stays in line with our expectations today, I imagine you might start to see a little bit of improvement here as well. But nonetheless, it's a very, very good place for us to be. Um, and, and I think having this point of equivalence where both businesses in round numbers are generating 50% return on capital is a great place for us as a management team to be because it means when we're considering which sites do we do, you know, do we do one brand ahead of the other? The answers are quite straight. No, we look for the best sites that we can find. If they fall for escape pump, we build escape pump. If, we, if they fall for boom, we build boom. I think it's a really nice place for us to be. I mentioned that one of the other sort of real facets of last year, um, strategically at least, was to try and find these opportunities to build additional capacity um, in, in both businesses. And what we're shown here on this chart, and this happens to be for um, our, one of our escape hunt sites, it happens to be for our escape hunt site in Oxford. And what we've done here is we've looked at days, you know, a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, where demand is not constrained by, um, by supply. And, and what we can see is these demand curves that are fairly well um, normalized across days. The, and and when, you, when you then overlay that normalized demand curve on a day, a Saturday, for example, where really all of our game rooms are just sold out and you've got this latent demand, that gap between the gray boxes and the curve that you see is essentially pointing to a demand opportunity that we're unable to service given the lack of capacity that we have in the business. So, 
classically a pricing consultant might point to this and say, well, look, this is where you get into airline pricing. This is where you push your prices up in these points. But we're quite reluctant to do that. We're, we're, we're firm believers in kind of holding to price and trying to remain a great value proposition for customers, irrespective of the day that you come. So instead, we've approached it by trying to find more opportunities to create space. So in Oxford, in, Oxford um, in this particular example, we were able to take a corporate room that we had previously and turn that into a games room. And, and similarly, um, another VR space we were able to turn into a games room too. So adding a little bit more capacity. And you can see that that theory is kind of coming together because I, I think you can hopefully see on the slide now where that dotted line is. That's kind of showing now the, the additional theoretical capacity that we've now created and indeed the extent to which the demand has naturally fed into it. So it's been a really nice way to start to close that gap without having to go to price. Um, so so um, hopefully that gives you an idea on it on Escape Hunt, where some of the work over the year has been, and, and certainly Graham will talk in the numbers to the, um, the capital allocation that we put towards this expansionary capital. If we move on to the next slide, it's showing a kind of similar thing, but for Boot. And in Boom, you know, it, again, we have a lot of analysis that sits around this latent demand and where indeed we're fully capped out on games particularly. So the start point, the, the start point on this analysis was to say, well, look, if we, uh, what, what we need to understand is what the marginal return is for every additional incidence of a game and in what order. So, for example, if I already have three axe lanes um, in a site, is it better for me on a rate of return per square foot to put in a fourth axe lane, or actually would I be better putting in Darts lane number six? I, I, I hope you take that you, you understand the premise. And so we, we've kind of worked through that and we've understood it. And so here we've been able in a number of sites now to come back and really think about how we rejig, how we add um, new games opportunities, where we do that and, and, and how. So rather than it just being a gut feel thing, as we, as we grow and as we learn, our analytics are getting a lot better. We're getting a lot tighter on data. And indeed, um, you, you know, we're starting to see some really good results from that within, within the uh, capacity constrained businesses. We thought that um, it would be worth just touching on the performance of sort of franchise acquisitions, et cetera. So when we, 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 we've talked in Boom um, a little bit about our sort of propensity to take back a few of the franchise sites. And, what I think has been good to see is that at the point when we've taken those sites back, as we start to bring them back onto our owned platform, as, as they start to see the benefit of our team, our ops, our marketing, et cetera, um, we, we're seeing this kind of uptick in performance as well. So for, from a, again, from a return on capital perspective, um, we, we feel that these are really good things to do. There's a strategic benefit to it as well, as we've discussed. But actually, transactionally, um, these acquisitions are tending to return really well for us, notwithstanding the fact that we, we, we typically don't pay for them upfront in cash. We typically simply use the cash flow um, generated from the sites to pay the vendors for them over a period of time. But that notwithstanding, if you normalize for the capital, um, the, the returns are looking attractive in a large part because we, we, we typically see this kind of uptick in performance. So we thought it might just be important just to point out to you on the call um, but sort of that's that's why transactionally we're doing what we're doing, um, aside from the strategic benefit of bringing that platform together and normalising the performance somewhat between franchise and O and O. But, but hopefully that gives you a flavour for what we've been doing operationally. Obviously, really happy to take any questions. Um, but I thought it might be good to pass over to Graham to get a little bit more in depth into the financial statements. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, so just adding to what Richard has already talked about in terms of the performance, if we start with the PL and uh, where the business has performed in the last 15 months, clearly, as Richard emphasized, the big feature is a significant increase in revenue, uh, you know, creating a business of much greater scale, um, nearly 60 million pounds of turnover in that 15 months, and driven by those very strong like for like growth. Uh, statistics from both Escape Hunt and from Boom. Some of that like for like, obviously, we've talked about the focus in the last year around operational improvement, around capacity utilization, using the data analytics, which we've really invested in in the last year to be able to, to uh, bring that sort of science to the fore. And that's really uh, part of the reason we're seeing those strong like for likes is the improvements we were able to make in some of those sites um, through, through utilizing capacity better in the last year. 
Um, if we look at the uh, gross margins, really pleasing to see boom gross margins in particular, um, improving from 52% up to 59%. Um, that's really driven by um, two, two main uh, aspects. Number one is uh, just improved labor utilization. There is obviously a cost of sale um, uh, labor that sits in cost of sale, which is your sort of variable labor cost. Um, part of that is maturity of the sites, which it talks about early on uh, sites will tend to make a loss, will tend to have higher labor ratios in early days. And as we get more efficient, that labor ratio can come down. So that's a, a manifestation of that is seeing that gross margin improvement uh, in boom. The other aspect of, of boom gross margin is, um, again, around the operational uh, uh, improvement approach, which we took last year. Uh, we implemented new systems into our uh, into all of our stores. So we now have um, an upgrade and sort of industry leading uh, solution, uh, point of sale and booking systems, which is managing uh, gross margin much better. So we've got uh, real consistency now across the estate in terms of our gross margins, particularly on drinks. So that's been uh, about a couple of percentage points which have improved through the implementation of those systems. Escape plants, <coughs> site level EBITDA margins uh, sustained at 42%. Again, that's significantly higher than we had originally anticipated, and it seems to have settled down at that rate. Um, which is a really, really strong result. Obviously, very nice cash generative, um, high contribution businesses with relatively low direct cost of sale. So any increase in sales tends to drop, um, you know, the very vast majority of that tends to drop to the bottom of the line. Um, Richard's already spoken about the boom site level EBITDA margins, so I won't go on, uh, on that much more. Um, but obviously, part of that improvement is also uh, an improvement in the gross margin, which again comes back to labor and, and our sort of management of the teams. Um, <clears throat> the feature, I guess, was the adjusted EBITDA on a pre-IFRS basis of 6.3 million, post-IFRS 16 to 9.9 .9 million, but obviously um, uh, for those who aren't aware, IFRS 16 pushes rent costs to uh, interest and depreciation, just the way the capitalized leases and so on. So, we certainly manage the business on the basis that rent is an operating cost and we need to cover it. So we focus on that 6.3 million, which is ahead of where um, the uh, market was at 6.1. So a pleasing result to come out modestly ahead of, of um, where uh, we had anticipated. Um, the other sort of uh, feature, obviously, uh, group operating profit uh, this year, or this 15 months, of 1.9 million versus a loss uh, of 4.9, and um, that was after last year, there was a fair value adjustment of 6.2 million profit, uh, which would have given us an overall profit last year, but that's again an IFRS non-cash adjustment. So taking those out uh, in the current year, there was a, a, a loss of 300,000, um, which I reversed out, and also there is a, a notional profit on the closure of one of our subsidiaries of 400,000. So adjusting for those two items, the 1.9, for, um, profit versus a loss of 4.9 last year is the is the correct comparable um, in, in in my view. Um, so I think that sort of covers most of most of the uh, points that we have on there. Um, obviously, central costs um, you'll see uh, coming through at 10 million for the 15 months versus 6 million for 12 months. So on a pro rata basis, it would have been six plays eight. Um, within that, um, there are some questions on that. We'll come back and give a bit more detail um, as we as we uh, as we answer those questions. If we turn to the cash flow, um, really this is the focus of the business. It's all about cash generation. Uh, notwithstanding what sits in the PNL, the business is now significantly cash pro profitable, cash positive. Um, <clears throat> on a post IFRS 16 basis, we've got 11.1 million of cash generated from operating activities. Again, if I take off the rent payments which we made, there was 7.9 million pounds of, uh, of underlying cash generation from the business, which compares to the 6.3 million of EBITDA. So again, a very strong positive working capital uh, movement. Uh, we do uh, expect that to continue, albeit, albeit probably not at quite the same rate. We are inherently a negative working capital type of business. So as we grow, we will tend to generate more cash than we grow. And the reason for that, of course, is that uh, certainly in the state hunt and to an extent for Boo as well, our customers pay in advance and we typically we pay our creditors 
in arrears. So you have that positive working capital benefit. In the shorter term, we also have a very significant benefit from new sites where typically we have um, a year, two years, or even as much as four years of either zero rent to pay or reduced rent. Um, but uh, we are accounting for the full rent through the PL. So you're getting a positive working capital be benefit, certainly in those early years. So um, that's the reason we're seeing a significant additional cash generation when you compare it to the EBITDA. Um, again, if I look at the sort of underlying um, profitability of the business, that that um, 7.9 million we invested significantly into um, fixed assets and expansion. Um, of that um, 8.1 million or 8.3 million you see uh, between tangible fixed assets and intangible um, fixed, uh, fixed assets, um, the majority of that was on new sites. So Richard mentioned opening Canterbury, uh, South Bend, Dubai, and working in the last year. There was also some capex from the very back end of 2022, where we just opened sites um, such as Oxford Street, um, Leeds, uh, Birmingham, and all opened towards the back end of 2022. And there was some capex which uh, we, we paid and, and finalized going into January. So of that uh, 8.1 million, 4.3 million was on new sites. We also spent um, just over two and a half million pound on expanding capacity. Uh, again, talking, speaking to those slides that Richard was talking about in terms of utilizing, um, growing into additional demand, both in escape hunt um, and in boom. So uh, I would characterize that as expansionary capex, um, some of which would have driven some of the, um, the like for like growth that we spoke about. And then there's just over a million pounds, 1.1 million pounds of what I would call true maintenance capex. Going forward, um, often I get this question is what is the what is the ongoing maintenance capex level within this business? Uh, we've done a bit of work around this. We're not there yet, but I think longer term, we're probably going to be running at around about 3% of sales. I think is a good proxy for what maintenance capex would be. We'll spend a bit less than that, I think, in the current year. But if you work on that as a basis, you can see that the underlying business is, is very cash profitable. So again, if you just take this as a proxy, you say we generated 7.9 million pounds worth of, of operating cash flow. If we were to spend 1.8 million, which is 3% of roughly six, six, uh, 60 million, um, that would have left us with uh, just over 6 million pounds of essentially free cash flow. We don't have a lot of debt, so there's not a huge interest um, there's not much interest to pay and we don't have a tax bill. So essentially that six million pounds is free cash flow, which is enabling us to continue to grow our estate. So that's the way I think of the business in terms of it is a profitable business. It made six million pounds worth of cash profit last year after accounting for what would be a normalized level of, of maintenance capex. So very, very strong cash generation um, that's coming out of the business. And uh, giving us that opportunity by allocating that capital uh, to new sites. Um, if we look at the um, acquisitions, uh, Richard spoke about the acquisitions for um, well, some of the franchise sites. Uh, we actually only there was only fifty thousand pounds of cash which we paid up front for those. Um, as mentioned, what the model typically is to pay a modest amount up front and then uh, defer the remainder of any payment. Um, which uh, over a three-year period uh, on a low interest rate and it's generally aimed to be funded out of the cash that's generated from the site that you've taken over. So you would have seen um, an increase on the balance sheet in vendor loans and that's what that is. So it's the, it's the, it's the deferred payments to, um, to former franchisees. Um, within, the balance, within the cash flow, um, in terms of... Uh, I suppose debt and debt movement. Um, we did pay the thick end of a million pound, nine hundred thousand pounds was the final deferred consideration on the boom acquisition, um, and also the final deferred consideration on the acquisition of Cardiff, uh, which we paid out. Um, we also made one point eight million of other loan repayments during the year, offset by two point one million of additional vendor finance, which came in, which is movement on the balance sheet rather than sort of. Um, true cash inflow, but nevertheless, it appears in the cash flow statement. Um, I think that sort of covers everything. The IFRS 16 payments, repayments of 3.1 million 
is what I would regard. That's really rent payment. So hence the difference between the sort of 11, 11 million of uh, cash generated uh, to the sort of 7.9 million of what I would call sort of pre IFRS 16, the true sort of operating cash generation in business. Could we move on to the balance sheet? Uh, the big movements clearly are those associated with the investment program that we've had in the last year. So you've seen a significant increase in uh, property, plants and equipment, fixed assets um, as a result of that investment program. And also from the acquisitions which we've made where we brought in uh, obviously this uh, fixed asset base uh, which comes in from those acquisitions which previously wouldn't have been on our balance sheet. So that's really the main feature. <laughs> uh, cash up slightly on last year, although net debt um, with the net cash position, given the additional vendor finance and so on that we've brought on, um, has fallen modestly um, over the uh, over the year, uh, just with the uh, taking on of that vendor finance. Um, the uh, rights of use assets and um, lease liabilities uh, increased in line with the, the new sites opening and also the acquisitions, which we would have to account for. Um, so. 2.5 million increase in right of use assets is really directly from Dubai, Canterbury, South Bend, working and also the acquisitions we've brought on. Um, and, and so you would see that um, see that following through. Um, in terms of the debt at the end of the year, 3.9 million pounds of debt on the balance sheet of that, really only uh, 1.2 million is what I would call sort of traditional debt. Um, the fit out finance of one and a half million is mostly uh, sort of higher purchase type arrangements where you've got um, you've got leases but actually we take ownership of the equipment at the end of the um, at the end of the, the, the term so for example our shuffle boards um, and things like that you pay a monthly rent and after three years we'll own the equipment so we account for it as a finance lease or as fit out finance in that way um, and and that sits on the balance sheet as debt and then the balance you can see there just over a million pounds of vendor loans uh, which is those deferred consideration um, that's still due on the acquisition of the franchisees. Uh, I think really, really good news, uh, big, big news for us is uh, we received full credit approval uh, for a £10 million revolving credit facility from Barclays, um, we, um, which gives us significant flexibility. Uh, it is not our intention to take on... Um, uh, significant debt onto the balance sheet. Um, but what this does do is it gives us a very significant cash headroom that we can manage day to day. So in terms of the working capital through the year, where typically we have quieter periods at the beginning of the year, you'll all be aware how important the Christmas and end of year season is for us. And that generates a lot of cash. What this enables us to do is to, to smooth out the, the timing of opening new sites and building new sites where we can utilize the facility without having to wait until we generated the cash. It also means that as I pay down the vendor loans, given that we're sitting in a sort of net, um, you know, zero net cash, net debt position, slightly net cash at the end of the year, um, as I pay down those vendor loans, I would otherwise have had to see the net cash balance building up just to create headroom against, um, against our sort of day-to-day -day performance. With the ability to, with the facility in place, I can now, as I repay those, I can replace it with with bank debt, maintain our sort of position at close to, to um, zero net cash net debt if that's how we um, manage it, and that just gives us a, an ability to accelerate our rollout, um, to go out with more confidence when we're talking to landlords to secure new sites and be more proactive about that rather than having to wait until we build the cash balance up before we start taking on those uh, obligations. So really, really, I think a significant uh, step forward for us. The other point which it clearly signals, uh, we keep talking about the fact that we have, we've developed enormously over the last three years, if you think where we've come from, in terms of the scale of the business, this is a real, I think, uh, stamp of approval from, from the banks, um, you know, endorsing the fact that we're now a, you know, a, a, a significantly more stable, mature, predictable business, which they are prepared to lend a, a decent amount of money to. So um, a very, very good step forward. Um, I think with that, um, I'll pass back to Richard. He can talk a little bit about um, our post-period highlights and how trading's been going. Sure. So thank you, Graham. Um, 
I, obviously, um, there are a couple of questions that have come through as well um, in and around this. But one of the comments, um, what one of the things that we talked about in our post period trading is the fact that um, obviously, yes, there are still positive like for likes and still very much volume driven. They are, as you can see, obviously a little lower than or some, some um, somewhat lower than they have been historically. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, and uh, and why we think that is. So. I guess that the positive news is that the like for likes, um, first of all, are following huge counterfactuals. So 22% in boom and 17% uh, and in escape on. So those are the numbers that we're tracking. So if you took anything of a smoothed approach on the like for like growth, then obviously these are still very, very high numbers. But then seeing, you know, 72% on boom, 1.5% on the escape on is lower than we've obviously reported previously. So there's actually a bit of a story within that um, that I think is worth explaining. And um, it's kind of twofold, actually. And, 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 it's, and it reinforces why we're actually still fairly confident in the number which is in the market at the moment, you know, sort of circa 5% for the year, again, all volume driven, and why we think we'll trade back to that. So um, when uh, the, the first couple of months of our financial year, so April, May um, into June, like for likes were good um, and they were strong. The thing that um, negatively impacted them um, was the, uh, were the majorly the two weeks of riots in August, which meant that on our boom business, we actually had to close very early um, on, on, in a number of units um, for the two week period, if we could open at all. There were certainly um, quite large towns for us where people were just simply not going out for fear of um, what, what was going on on the streets. And that did really have a very negative effect on us. It pushed us, um, it, it pushed us obviously in, into a place we haven't been before. Um, uh, what I would say now is that that having been an isolated incident, already now we've seen our life flights kind of recover back through that. So you have got quite a lot of dilution in August, but the underlying trend is very much back to where we would hope it would be. Now, can we continue to deliver life likes at 20% year on year? Obviously not, that's clearly impossible. But do we think that that target that we have for ourselves, circa five, is still very much on? Yes, we do. Um, so, so ultimately, we're feeling we're feeling very confident with where trading is going, um, and, and and reinforced by some very good pre-bookings already for that all important Q4 calendar Q4 period. So as we trade into Christmas, already now we're starting to see much bigger corporate bookings than we've seen, well, you know, significantly bigger than we've seen at um, this kind of time of year previously. Some very large numbers. The team have worked extremely hard to work out how we get more capacity out of some of the bigger sites, particularly on the boom side, um, where you know, last year we would have been selling a couple of slots in a day. So you take Oxford Street would be a good example. You might sell um, two four-hour slots on exclusive hire. Well, we've worked out now how to sell um, up to six um, in an equivalent day. So we've put more capacity into the business. We're getting a little bit braver as a brand. You know, last year we would have been very much taking all the revenue opportunity that was coming at us. Whereas now we're actually holding back and we're saying, actually, if this booking is not of a significant enough scale, we're not going to take it. We'll put you on a waiting list right now, but we're not actually going to take it today because we're, we're confident that we'll be able to find much, much larger bookings to kind of, uh, you know, fill that space. So, so as we're sat today, we're, we're, you know, as optimistic as we can be about how calendar Q4 will trade. That gives us a lot of confidence um, for, for the numbers overall. And I think overarchingly, we're, we, we feel we're in a really exciting place. We've got um, you know, clearly the benefit of the RCF, as Graham has discussed, which should see us start to nudge up the pace of growth again. It's been a real privilege to be able to open nonetheless or be in built on um, sort of five or six sites already this year organically funded. That's a step change from where we've been historically. So I think all these things coming together, I, I would suggest stands us in fairly good stead. Um, but in, in terms of... Um, Picking up just a few, some of the questions um, that are here, um, I'm not going to take these in any sort of particular order, um, but uh, obviously the like for like question has come up a number of times. Hopefully that has given you a little bit more flavour as to why it has been a little bit lower on average over the period, but why we expect that to come back and what it was that specifically um, uh, impacted negatively. Um, just looking at some of the questions here, um, we've got a question around the Roki figures, um, which is asking, saying, um, given that you exclude sites that haven't been open for a year, 
What would you say is the average payback for the project? So it's very few circle, 45% after a year. Is it okay to assume that it's around three, three and a half years payback? Um, no, the payback is quicker than that. So if you were to do, I think what that question is alluding to is um, what the result would look like if you did a fully cash on cash payback, i.e. I talked about the fact that we make um, losses as we open sites um, and uh, therefore that would be dilutive. Hence, when we're talking about the return, we take the kind of year one and beyond um, LTM for EBITDA. But actually, if you were doing cash on cash, the dynamic that would go in your favour, that you have a greater offset in the rent-free periods that you also achieve. Um, so, so one would more than offset the other. So long-winded way of saying that actually the paybacks are much more two to two and a half years than three to three and a half. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, is uh, is rent included? Yes, it is. It's fully accounted for, irrespective of whether or not we're paying it, i.e. even if it's a rent-free period, we still take it in there. Um, question, would we consider to buy the land and the properties that we operate? No, uh, we think that leasing is the right thing for us. We're not a property company. We are a uh, we're, we're an operations company. So I think leasing the I sites. Think, is I, think, I think on that, in any event, you know, the, the, the sites that perform best, certainly for escape hunt, have tended to be in sort of the popular high footfall shopping um, yeah. uh, centres and so on, where obviously one can't buy those sites. You, you are leasing off a, it, it, off exactly a, land, right. off a landlord. So, that's certainly the, the approach um, that we've taken on that. Um, when do you anticipate making a profit after tax? Um, so we anticipate... Oh, yeah, you want to say, yeah. go um, actually, I mean, that, that is, you know, I've spoken about what, where I think we are in terms of cash profit. I do think in the next in the next 12 months, we should be pretty close to, um, I would hope to be a positive profit after after tax, but it's, it's, if you look at the forecast, it's, it's sort of there or thereabouts. I mean, the interesting point is, and then thereafter we sort of move quite quickly into into, into profit. Um, had we accounted under UK gap in the current year, we would have shown a profit after tax of over a million pounds. So we are being penalised under IFRS 16, and the reason for that is because we're a young business. All of our leases are towards the beginning of their of their of the period, which means that the interest charge that we're charging. On those leases is at its highest. It's also exacerbated, we spoke about this before, by the fact that because we have rent-free periods, the value of the lease actually goes up on the balance sheet rather than coming down, which means the interest charge has increased as a result of that because you're charging it on a higher balance. So we've got this sort of slightly non-cash anomaly where you're having a big charge against um, uh, for, for your property costs, which is penalizing you because they're all at the start of their of, of the leases rather than averaging it out. So under UK gap, you would average out the rent over the entire period of the, of the, the lease and you would charge the same amount each year uh, to your PL. Under IFRS, you front load all of that and you have a much higher charge at the beginning where you have a high interest charge and a lower charge towards the end. So had we accounted under UK gap, we would have been showing a, just over a million pound um, a profit after tax in the current year. So certainly, Again, the way I look at it was, as I described it, if you want to really see, is the business making money, is it profitable? Look at the cash flow statement. As I said, 7.9 million pound of operating cash flow. Uh, even if you say, assume we're paying, let's say 200,000 pound of, of interest charge in the year, you take that off and the other obligation would be a maintenance capex number, which is a which would in, in real money terms replaces depreciation and our maintenance capex at a full run rate on the current numbers would have been something like one and a half to 1.8 million. So you can see from that that the underlying business is really cash profit, is cash profitable. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that's good. Um, in light of the fact that the share price is declining while performance is improving and cash generation is solid, would you consider share buybacks, uh, share buybacks, sorry, um, if you lack alternative reinvestment opportunities? I think the quick answer to that is yes, we would. Um, we consider the obviously return on capital and return on equity, your sort of two dynamics. Given that we are returning on capital at circa 50%, it's always quite difficult to make the case to say that we should be buying uh, back our own shares, albeit you could make a very strong case to argue that the return on equity would be strong if we did. So yes, it is something that we consider and with an RCF, it might even be something that we uh, that, 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 that we might uh, that we might do. Um, we said that Dubai is a test pilot for expansion. What countries would be on top of the list for expansion? 
uh, Germany, France, Spain, um, question mark. Um, Dubai is a test bed for expansion. Certainly, we are learning a lot about how to operate um, an owned site from here, and that's been really, really valuable. Um, there are a couple of points on the strategic approach to international expansion. One, and I would stress this, is that as we stand in the here and now, there is an awful lot to go after in the UK. We, we've said for, um, for quite a long time now that we think there are at least 50 escape pumps in the UK and at least 100 um, booms. And with a, a, an elevated sort of capital facility now to be able to go after those, we really do think that while we're returning the way that we are here in a market that we understand backwards, forwards and every which way, the UK should be the focus and it will be our focus for a while. Um, that said, obviously we do consider where you might go at a point in time. Um, I think one of the things that makes it a little bit easier to expand Germany is where English is, is, um, is prominent as a language. And the reason for that is that brand and tone of voice is a really important thing with consumer facing brands and trying to find tone of voice in a translated language, that's really, really difficult. So, um, so, so that's, that's a consideration. Runway is obviously a consideration. Um, you know, it's not worth doing unless we can have quite a significant number of sites over there, given that you would have to put a small head office in place, given you'd have to have feet on the ground. Um, I think the very, very obvious answer um, uh, for, for both businesses is the US. Um, you know, there should be a runway for a very substantial number of sites in the US. Um, is that something that we're thinking about? Obviously, it's something that we consider. Is it something we're likely to do in the very near term? No, we don't feel that we're in the right place as a business, given the opportunity in the UK to yet need to be doing that in the US. So hope, hopefully that answers that question. Um, in terms of the next one, um, how do you see emerging concepts like virtual reality and escape pod stores impacting our business? Um, VR is interesting. We've done a lot of VR ourselves. Um, actually, the data is stark. It does not do as well as the physical games. And in fact, we've taken our virtual reality businesses out almost entirely to replace with physical games. And certainly we're on a journey just to do the last few. And um, performance has been a step change every time we've done that. So I think VR, um, you know, maybe one day that is a great place to play. I think right now it's a little bit early. Technology still got a way to go. And fundamentally, the thing that we do, which is bringing people together to have a good time together, that's the thing I think that makes Escape Hunt such an attractive business, um, and, and VR somewhat removes you from that. So, um, so we're, we're we're not seeing that as a particular threat. Um, how does return on capital chart on the slides? Uh, how is it sorted? Is the numbering representing the number, the order of the stores opened? No, it's not. The the numbering is simply um, kind of ranking return on capital high to low. Um, it's on Escape Hunt for what it's worth. It is broadly speaking the case that the lower the return on capital the older the site and the reason for that is that typically the newer sites have hit the ground running better as we've been able to attract higher caliber property now that it's a more established business and we build them for quite a lot less money so you've got a denominator and a numerator um, benefit on both sides and escape pump so that's what you're seeing there boom obviously it being very much a younger business is a little bit more random in terms of which site we open in what order um but that will you know it would be interesting to see if that goes on to follow similar part um a, a similar path as the performances mature somewhat um uh, how have the newly acquired, sorry, forgive me, my eyes are terrible. How have the newly opened and acquired boom sites performed relative to our expectations? Can you please also comment on the current pipeline for further site openings and how you prioritize locations and assess new site developments? Um, so um, in the main, we've been really happy with the new sites that we've opened. Um, you know, in fact, in one particular case, we've been stunned. We opened a site in Canterbury um, over the last year, oh and oh. And uh, it's definitely true to say that that has dramatically superseded our expectations for that site. It really has kind of hit that site, guys, there in Canterbury. So it's been really exciting. Dubai, we've talked about, um, uh, you know, uh, a, li a little bit already. But, um, you know, it's doing, that's, that Dubai's doing what we hope that Dubai would do, um, sort of right, right sort of in the midpoint of our expectations and South End, um, again, is, is exactly in line with the expect, uh, expectation for, from the model. So, um, so, so those kind of feel like a good place to be. In terms of the second part of that question, how do we consider 
new sites to go into. Um, we're learning with every new site that we open and those learnings get compiled into a data analytics model. Ostensibly, we try to normalize for the things that are unique to our site. We try to normalize for the size of the units, the quality of the team, the newness of the teams and so on and so forth. And then once we've done that, we take that performance and we overlay lots of city type dynamics. So that might be population densities, worker densities, it might be affluent scores, it might be adjacencies, i.e. other leisure and hospitality businesses. And in so doing, you build essentially a multiple regression model that says, we believe that the six or seven variables that most link to uh, performance look like this. And therefore, here are the, set, the cities and towns where these characteristics are best exhibited. So th there is a bit of a science to it. Um, I would stress that there is never an exact science. And even if that data takes you to the right town, you've still got to find the right site. And even if you find the right site, the right site's got to become available. So it is certainly an inexact science, but there is a degree of science behind it, if, if that makes sense. Um, the other in the room is the share price has fallen to uh, year lows regardless of the performance of the company. What is the management doing to actively improve the share price and when will the company show a post-tax profit? Well, Greg's already talked the post-tax profit and we have actually done quite a lot in terms of trying to mix up the share register a little bit. I mean, Greg, do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think certainly from a sort of public perspective, um, the bigger change which you will see uh, in the share register was, you will recall that when we bought Boom, uh, the sellers of Boom, the former owners, was uh, MFT Capital, who owned just under 15% of the company. Um, I suspect that may have been a fear of a bit of an overhang at some point. Um, that stake was placed out in its entirety um, in uh, May this year. Um, with the British Business Growth Fund, BGF, taking the entire stake. So we've got a very, very uh, supportive shareholder there that's come on the register. Um, there was quite a lot of sort of retail um, uh, sort of interest, um, particularly during COVID. Um, we had a, a number of sort of fairly sizable retail shareholders on the register who um, have moved on, and that's all been cleared up as well. So there's been quite a lot of work around the register. It's, it's in, I think, in a very good shape now. We've got some good institutional support coming in. Um, obviously, you know, we would like to see more of uh, the retail interest coming back, and our focus uh, in the next period is to spend a bit more time with some of these retail forums um, this being one, um, we are presenting at things like Share Society. We're going to, you know, we will look at the Mellow events and things like that. I think just um, starting to talk with a bit more confidence around the performance of the business, um, the fact that we have the credit facility and therefore we can be much more assertive around the pace at which we grow the business. I think all of those things should happen. Clearly, it's a big frustration um, uh, for you and for us. Um, why do franchisees sell to you if the business is so good? Are the prices for buyback of the franchise sites uh, attractive for XP Factory? Um, it, uh, the, the bulk of our franchise position was somewhat inherited through the um, through, through the early stages of the boom acquisition, and, and a number of our franchisees do not have the capital to grow into five, six, seven sites. And, and the, the challenge inherent in that is that even if you're only trading one site, you still need to have marketing, ops, finance, all the stuff that you have that would otherwise get leveraged across a number of sites. So it is very much harder to operate one site, in it, financially that is, than several. So with that is given, um, and also combined with the fact that actually running operations like this is hard work, it is late, it is great, you have to be on the ground, you have to be in store, you have to be understanding the consumer dynamics, you have to be present. It's not an easy business to invest in and allow to grow. So I think for some of the early franchisees, um, it, it has just become apparent that they would need to have far more time in their sites and or have far more scope in order to have big teams in place to run them than perhaps they have available to, uh, to, to them at the point. So, so on that basis, it's been um, quite attractive for us to buy them back. Um, the specific question about is it attractive for XP Factory, the obvious answer to that is yes, otherwise we wouldn't do it. Um, we consider buying them back in the same way as we consider returning on any capital that we expend. 
Um, so the, the ratios in terms of incremental EBITDA to us um, are, are still going to be low. Um, and moreover, because we typically vend or finance them, that from a cash perspective, they're very, very attractive. Plus, then you've got the brand overlay, the, the strategic synergy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, this is a slightly embarrassing one. Um, I didn't get answers from corporate at xbfactory.com. Is that email address still right? It is still correct. I don't know why that would have been. We'll look into it. Apologies for that. Um, uh, can you confirm the central costs are under control, um, i.e. have you already geared the cost base in advance and what you have in place is enough? It seems a very high number, even though I appreciate the rationale for investing to support the business growth. Um, thank you. Graham, do you want to say that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so if we look at the, um, the, 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 the cost base, as you as you pointed out, in terms of uh, what's there, there's 10 million. Um, I mentioned, as I was talking through that, 8 million on a pro rata basis. So an increase, obviously, of about... 20, oh, 25, 35% on, on the fully earned the previous year. Um, I should just sort of go back. If you look at where that increase came from, the majority of it was in people. Um, so there were the fully earned effects. As we grew in 2022 in particular, we added quite a lot of central cost um, through people. Um, if you think of what, uh, about 55, 60% of our total central cost base is people. Um, so who, who is that? Obviously, we've got We've got marketing teams um, for each of Boom and for Escape Hunt. Those are those costs are allocated um, to some extent in the um, segmental analysis, but a lot of it sits in, in head office. Certainly, I don't see a need to be expanding that much so that that can support a much bigger business. We've got a finance team which should be able to support a much bigger business. Uh, we will see sort of incremental increases as the business grows is in the operations team where um, we have got uh, sort of regional um, operators and so on. So you know, every time you add five sites, you're probably looking at another regional uh, manager. Um, so there will be some incremental increase. There are some other areas where some modest increases will come in, but again, you've got the core of what's there. Um, I think one of, the, one of the bigger increases you would have seen is that historically we've never had, we've never paid any um, variable compensation um, looking forward, we are looking across the entire group to, to introduce a, a, a bonus scheme for all of our head office staff. Um, so, you know, that obviously adds probably 10 or 15 percent to your people cost um, once you do that. So that is certainly in the budgets, but it's not committed and would always be dependent on performance anyway. So you've got that as a sort of variable cost. I think to answer the question is, yes, I think the central costs are under control. Um, you know, obviously things like audit fees, professional fees have gone up quite a lot in the last year, um, just from an inflationary perspective, but also with the growth of the business has been a very significant increase in those sorts of areas. But I believe we've got those under control. We will see some small incremental increases as we add a few more people as the business grows. But in general speak, you should have a much, much stronger leverage on that full uh, central cost um, as we move forward. Great, probably another one for you. Uh, can the company provide some information to why trade payables have uh, doubled to three point eight billion pounds? Provide some context uh, to what those payables are. Yeah, I, I, I can certainly give some some colour on that. Obviously, the business is bigger, um, so just in terms of the relative size of turnover compared to where we were, um, what we've got is obviously normal sort of trade payables. Um, Somewhat, somewhat uh, embarrassing, I suppose. I would say one of the biggest reasons for the increase is just because of the way we account for business rates. And um, what happens, obviously, at the end of March is you get the full business rates bill for all of your sites for the coming financial year. And the way that that is accounted for is we put a hundred percent of that, the full year's worth of rates, into trade creditors, and there's an offset in um, prepayments um, to the extent that it hasn't been paid, even though those, those are actually only paid over 12 months. So there's about um, the thick end of a million pound of that increase is actually business rates, um, which is just for the coming year. Um, so it's not immediately payable, it is actually paid over the period of the year. So that is the biggest, the biggest uh, change in that. And because we have, um, uh, because it's a March year and you get that sort of impact rather than in December. So that's 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 probably the biggest reason. The other the other big issue impact in the current year is 
um, a lot of our sites have um, turnover rent. And in particular, Oxford Street, where our biggest uh, our biggest site and the biggest component of turnover rent, the, the year that we measure that turnover rent runs to the end of March. So the turnover rent accrual, which would have been invoiced at that point, um, comes in. So that, that would be a one-off uh, one change um, in the current year. So other than that, it's your normal trade creditors. Um, there's no, we're not, we're not in arrears. We're not um, holding back creditors or anything like that, if that's your concern. So conscious of time, there are quite a number of questions. I'll just go through a few of them very quickly, if that's okay. So um, when a new boom or escape punt is opened, how long does it take till maximum sales capacity is reached? Um, are the low light for light, um, I presume that's the post period, uh, a result of the quick ramp up of sales after opening? Um, so it's, it's very hard to answer that because given that like, even last year, escape punt did 17% um, light for light. And in some of that case, that's a seven year old business. And obviously it's still maturing. Uh, it's, well, you'd st strongly suggest that is therefore still maturing. Um, however, um, it, it, typically, you would suggest that a site should probably grow aggressively for um, the first year, a little bit less so in the second, start to, um, to kind of come down in year three and then normalise, you would hope, um, from that point onwards. Um, are the low light for lights a result of a quick ramp up of sales after opening? Uh, no, not in and of itself. We've talked about um, the light for lights in the post period and the impact there. But the more general point is it is absolutely true to say that light for lights on average get bolstered quite significantly by the number of sites that you open, i.e., Given that you'd expect year one like for likes to be the highest of any year, the more sites you open in a period, when those sites become like for like, you would expect to see quite a significant bolstering because of that. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, how we see competition for sites, um, lots of other attractive businesses. Um, we're not we're not struggling to attract sites. Our covenant is getting better. Um, it, it is getting better. Our Customer reviews have been very strong forever and a day, and landlords like that. So uh, we are not struggling to achieve sites. Would we consider a takeover another competitive social, um, socialising provider now that you have an RCF? Um, I think there's a big opportunity to do that. Um, is it the right time to do that right now? I'm not sure with the markets where they are, but is it something that we would consider at a point? Absolutely it is, in line with all the other strategic options that we have available to us. Uh, over what period of time a vendor loans typically taken out? So this is for the acquisition of the franchise stores, typically around three years. Um, what period is the 1.2 million pounds of outstanding vendor loans payable over? Um, as I say, like typically we, they're, they're done over three years. Um, so then depending on where they are on average. The balance, the balance of that, there is a breakdown um, in, in, the, uh, in the slide actually I've given, I think there's, if I remember off the top, yeah, there's 900,000 um, is actually payable in the next year, uh, just because it dates back to uh, the a couple of them were over two years and a couple of them over three years. Um, so that's what that is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what, what do you think about the penetration of escape rooms in the UK? Are there any data points to suggest that this concept can grow within the country or in other countries? Well, I think the penetration, of, well, if you take our data, so we're, we're the largest um, provider and our, um, and our growth has been stellar. And indeed, when we open new sites, they, they have been really consistently high performing. So I would suggest that that in and of itself suggests that there is a lot of penetration to go after. When you combine that with our property modeling that we discussed earlier, it points to quite a number of locations where we're not and where we should be. We have this conservative estimate, I would suggest, of 50 units in the UK. I still think that is more than achievable. I actually think the number might be bigger than that. Does that play out in other countries? Quickly, the answer to that is yes. Um, we in our own franchise business see just how well that plays out in other countries. Australia, France would be two really good examples where we've got a bit of density. Um, and can you extrapolate the same kind of variables that make escape rooms attractive here? in other markets, absolutely you can. Um, could we test dynamic pricing for peak times? Um, yes, we could test it. Um, we debate this internally a lot. Um, we have chosen instead to go after capacity rather than price. Um, largely because we feel that's the best thing in the long-term interest of keeping customers close and having those customers our brand ambassadors. It's not to say that we wouldn't do it at a point in time, and it is something that we think about and model a lot, but so far we have not felt the need to do it. Um, 
uh, what's that? Sorry, the business enjoys negative working capital and the site's already steady state. Would it be appropriate to expect a site to generate operating cash flow return on total capital employment of uh, 11 to 15 percent? I think you've already touched on that, Graham. Um, you've gone through the kind of the cash yeah, generation and something like that. Certainly, on a site level, it would be, be quite significant. Based on where we are, it would be quite significantly higher. Than yeah, sort of like the right. 3x that. So, um, uh, we one more question. I think we're running out yeah, of time. sorry, we are running out of time. Let's we'll take two more questions. Uh, yeah, so, um, do we expect to continue to get rent-free periods? Yes, is the quick answer to that. Uh, if someone takes the franchise site and sells it back to you, what's the economics look like? We've actually touched on that already. Um, so, um, and the, the second part of that question is whether or not that attracts you. Uh, it, it makes it easier or harder to attract new franchisees. A lot of the reason why we're doing what we're doing is in order to set the tone to be able to attract the higher caliber franchisee who can actually back 10 sites. So bringing the sites back into owner operation, getting those performance gains we've already talked about in the deck, and then being able to normalize performance, I think sets us up better to be able to sell to a more sophisticated franchisees further down the line. Um, I'm afraid there are still a few questions left. Um, not so many, but I am very conscious of your time. So um, we'll, we'll go through anything else. We'll, we'll, we'll answer and feedback to, um, to uh, IMC. But Jay, can I hand back to you? Absolutely, Richard, Graham, that's Graham. Thank you very much for your presentation and for answering all of those questions that came in from investors this morning. And of course, we will be able to give you back all of the questions that were submitted today. We'll give you those uh, back just for you to review to then add any additional responses, um, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the platform. Um, but Richard, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Sure. So I guess um, I guess the points I'd want you to, to leave today with is hopefully that real feeling of the continued momentum in the business. So I think, you know, we've had a pretty transformational effect of the um, through the site builds that we did in the prior year. You've started to really see that coming together to generate a business which is throwing off quite a lot of cash for its size, I would suggest. We're really excited about what that means. We're really excited about the fact that that has facilitated this organic um, uh, sort of new builds um, program through the current year that we're in right now. When you then combine that with the new news that is the RCF, I think really excitingly, you can hopefully understand that that allows us to nudge up our openings profile again. It doesn't require us to come back to the markets for equity. So I would, I would hope you'd all see that as a very, very positive thing. Um, in, in terms of the underlying metrics, as I say, all of them are moving in the directions that we wish. We've got a very stable business in a skate pump uh, uh, sitting at a very, very profitable level. And we've got really strong trajectories in boom. That sort of seven point margin gain over the last year is, is one of those reference points. That movement towards that aspirational 2022-25% EBITDA is very much on track. So. We've got, a, we, we've got a business that's throwing off really good cash. We've got great operating metrics. We're the highest reviewed business in the customer by customers of anybody in our sector. And we've got significant runway to go after and now a facility to fund that. So I suppose I would just con cl close um, just to say, you know, thank you ever so much for your support. Please do come back to us with the more questions that we haven't had a chance to answer. Um, and, and hopefully we'll see you again in a small number of months. Perfect. Richard, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. Uh, this will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of XP Factory PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good morning to you all.